Okay, I think we can jump on in. So welcome everybody to Transformation Points. This is gonna be a, an online discussion about redesigning child welfare to help youth and families thrive. My name is John Kelly. I'm gonna be your moderator today. I am uh, the senior editor of The Imprint, which is a daily news publication covering child welfare and youth justice systems around the country and all the many things that kind of spin around those systems, including housing stability and economics, mental health, education systems, all of that. Um, I'm also the co-executive director of Fostering Media Connections, which is the nonprofit parent of the imprint. Our other programs include our youth voice program through which we work with uh, youth, with uh, youth and young adults with experience in the system to raise up their voices through writing in other ways. And then also Fostering Families Today, which is our bi-monthly magazine that goes right into the homes of uh, kinship caregivers, foster parents, and other resource families. Uh, this event today is brought to you by our sponsor, Binti, uh, who offers modern, mobile-friendly software, driving measurable results and promoting quality practice. We have a great panel today for this. I'm really excited for this conversation. I'm just gonna quickly introduce them. You're gonna hear from them very soon. Jerry Milner, former associate commissioner of the US Children's Bureau, is one of the most senior positions in the child welfare hierarchy within the executive branch. We have Kelly Fong, an assistant professor, School of History and Sociology at Georgia Tech, who's done some really incredible research of late on the, uh, the maltreatment reporting and hotline process. Brian Blaylock, uh, in past lives, a, a lawyer and youth advocate and working in philanthropy, and now uh, the cabinet secretary for the New Mexico Children, Youth, and Families Department, and Sixto Cancel, who is the founder and CEO of the nonprofit Think of Us. And we are also joined by Barrett, uh, Barrett Johnson, who's the director of business development for Binti. So here is how this is going to go today. I have sort of challenged our uh, esteemed panel to each give us one kind of concrete, actionable, either new law or kind of specific policy change or program, something that they view to be uh, a trans would have a transformative effect on child welfare as we know it. So we're going to hear from each of them about that. Barrett is going to share some thoughts on how, you know, sort of technology is not is not in and of itself the reform, but can can help uh, on the path to, to most of the, the these types of ideas. Um, so before we we jump into everything, I am just going to pass it over to Barrett for for a quick for a quick moment. Great, thanks, John, um, and thanks for the the Foster Media's Connections team for putting this together. Um, really looking forward to the conversation today, um, and I as I have been starting out most of our presentations like this lately, I just wanted to start with acknowledging all the work that everybody participating in this call has done during the numerous crisis that we've been through over the past year and a half or so. Um, and our, you know, the great appreciation for everybody at all levels um, and the, the great challenges that we face. I think um, now we have, you know, this challenge is also an opportunity um, for us to transform the system and change the system to be something that really is something much better for the children and families and communities that we need. Um, so very briefly, for those of you who don't know about Binti, uh, like John said, we're a software company. Uh, we are based in Oakland, California. We build software specifically for child welfare. I was actually Binti's first customer when I was a program director in uh, child welfare um, in San Francisco County. Um, and since launching in San Francisco in um, 2000, uh, January 2017, um, we have now spread very quickly across the country. I joined about um, a year and a half ago. We're now in um, over 160 agencies, over 23 states, um, and uh, we serve about 21% of the child welfare system. Um, and, and we're really committed to the sort of transformational practice. We, we do a lot of research um, with youth and families as the sort of basis um, for all of our, all of our technology. Um, and that's where we start um, and, and really look at how we can transform the, transform the system. So we're, we're on that ride with all these transformative leaders um, and we wanna support it in any way we, any way we can. Um, and I, I, you know, I've had a number of different roles in, in child welfare, always kind of pushing for um, reform and changing and improving of the system as a social worker and um, as a leader in uh, training and workforce development. 
Um, and there's always this sort of tension between um, fixing the system and making it operate right and really transforming it into something that's fundamentally different and serves families and kids better. And I think this, um, this group of people is, um, are great folks to talk about the latter part, um, which is really um, changing the system to, to, to serve families and communities. So um, like John said, I'll be making some comments about how technology can support that. And uh, we at Binti definitely wanna support that and be along with you on that ride. But um, I will hand it back to John for, um, to, to get right to the panel. Sweet, so let's do this. Uh, very well said, Barrett. Um, like I said, we're gonna hear from the panel. I'll do a little bit of a round table that I'll moderate uh, with some follow-up questions for them, but then we're gonna turn it over right after that uh, to questions from attendees. And I would just ask that if you have a question for anybody in particular or for the whole group, include that in the chat section. We will be culling through to try and uh, find as many of those questions as we can with the time that we have left. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Jerry Milner first. Okay. Well, thanks so much, uh, John. And uh, thank you, uh, Barrett. Uh, Barrett, I uh, particularly appreciate your remarks about the difference between fixing what we have and, and transforming it in, into something quite different. And um, it's uh, a topic that's very near and dear uh, to my heart. I, I think one of the first things we have to ask ourselves is what are we trying to transform um, and what are we trying to transform it into? Um, for me, uh, based on years of, of talking very uh, intensely with parents and young people who have experienced our, our child welfare system, the, the transformation uh, has to center on fundamentally changing their experiences. Uh, I think numbers are, are, are just fine, but we have to be concerned with how parents, children and youth actually experience their own needs uh, for, for help uh, and what our response, how they experience our, our responses uh, to those uh, needs, because those experiences can shape their entire life trajectories. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I, I think uh, probably not a big surprise to anybody that the most transformational step uh, that we can take is to create funding parity. Um, between family strengthening, primary prevention efforts and programs with our more traditional child welfare interventions such as uh, foster care uh, and, and, and adoption. Uh, actually, if, if we're very serious about transformation, I think we would strive for a reversal uh, of the current um, incredible imbalance that heavily favors foster care and adoption in favor uh, of preventing um, the need for, for either one of those. Um, be clear that I'm talking about true community-based primary prevention, um, not necessarily the family first after the trauma has occurred brand of prevention. Um, I believe that such a move would have resounding effects on families' abilities uh, to care for their children, to remain together safely rather uh, than, than being separated. Uh, just as an example, it could send resources uh, to those families of, of color who are parentally overrepresented in foster care and overrepresented uh, among the poor. It could offer realistic uh, alternatives uh, for the 60% or so of children who enter foster care solely due uh, to what we call uh, neglect. And it could build the protective capacities of parents uh, and, and the protective factors uh, within uh, communities to support uh, and, and nurture families. I, I think that creating or, or correcting that imbalance in funding right now could totally transform uh, our very consistent approach uh, in child welfare to treating the symptoms uh, and, and trying to fix trauma after it's occurred into an approach of preventing it from occurring in the first place and, and helping families to remain strong uh, and, and, and to thrive. In terms of how to do that at, at a policy level, I, I think it could happen in, in, in various ways. Uh, federal funding uh, for foster care and adoption could certainly be flexed uh, to allow states uh, to use part of the largest uh, source of child welfare funding we have at the federal level out there, Title IV-E, to use that for 
for prevention. That's one way uh, of, of achieving uh, the, this goal of correcting the imbalance. Uh, alternately, um, CAPTA uh, could certainly be amended to greatly increase the amount of funding uh, available for primary prevention and, and to put that money into the communities uh, where families live and, and need to feel connected and, and supported. Uh, we, we have limited uh, evidence uh, to date on, on the effectiveness of, of some of these uh, approaches, but we still have enough uh, that demonstrates that it's effective. Chapin Hall, for example, conducted a study uh, of Allegheny County, Pennsylvania's uh, family support uh, centers back in uh, 2018 and found out uh, that there were fewer child maltreatment investigations in those communities where the family support centers were located uh, than those without a, a family support uh, uh, center. Uh, if we go beyond the federal level at the state level, uh, we can also push for state and local funds to go to those kinds of activities and supports uh, that offer promise uh, of reducing the need for hotline investigations uh, and for foster care placement, such as uh, the creation of uh, family resource centers within communities and, and warm lines instead of hotlines where families can get the support that they need uh, rather than being investigated. Similarly, an Alabama study a few years ago showed that for every $1 that the state put into family resources, uh, family resource centers, I should say, it, it got a $6 uh, return on investment in, in terms of uh, strong and, and resilient families. So just to end that, focusing on, on prevention, it, it's not rocket science in, in my view. If it were, um, we would not see long, desperate lines of people waiting to get a COVID vaccination uh, that could be prevented uh, with, with, with the vaccination. It's simply a matter of using basic common sense. So, so, thanks, so Jay, that, that's a good, uh, the, an excellent segue into to what Kelly's going to talk about, but before we get to her, I just want to ask, you know, obviously we all know that the, the federal government moves uh, at its own pace, slowly sometimes, right? On a local level, like state or county, what you're, what you're proposing to achieve there, right? A, a guarantee of parity. Yeah. Like, I guess that would require some sort of like, you, you really would probably need a law, right? To, to make sure that that happened. And especially with, various pressures from outside, uh, including federal funding, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the largest pot uh, the largest part of federal funding uh, for child welfare is Title IV-E, but uh, the largest portion of funding for child welfare in general comes from states uh, and localities. Uh, and I think that's where we can make a huge investment uh, in communities uh, that exist within those states and within those counties out there uh, to support families a whole lot better. Okay, Kelly, I am uh, just going to... Uh... Give me a second here while I find uh, our slides. Uh, apologies on the delay. Sure, and I can also sort of make some introductory comments as well as you set up the slides. And I think what I'll talk about uh, follows really nicely, as you said, from, from Jerry's comments. It's certainly consistent with what Jerry is uh, describing. So again, my name is Kelly Fong. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at Georgia Tech. And I was asked today to talk about one way to transform the front door of the child welfare system, meaning reporting and investigations. And in my research, I've spent time with various stakeholders in this process from people who report to Child Protective Services, CPS, people who get reported to, to CPS and CPS investigators. And briefly, what I wanna suggest is that the most important transformations to the front door won't take place within child welfare agencies, um, but actually beyond child welfare agencies. And I want to start this conversation um, by drawing a parallel to policing. So with national attention to police killings following things like traffic stops and mental health crises, people are asking, you know, why is it that we have an armed agent of the state responding to these situations, right? Does this make sense? How can we move these situations out of the purview of the police, right? Because even when they're not fatal, these encounters are quite traumatizing, especially for Black folks because of racism. And so I think that we should ask the same question with respect to child welfare. So John, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, 
Child Protective Services, CPS, has an enormously wide and quite unequal reach. So every year, three and a half million kids experience CPS reports, disproportionately Black and Native American children. But actually, most of these reports, uh, as you all probably know, close at intake, right? So CPS is declining to intervene further. Even still, these relatively short-term, low-level contracts are traumatizing and quite intrusive. So we're shuttling all of these millions of families to a system that really just generates a lot of fear and distrust in low-income communities and communities of color. And these families often need things like housing that CPS isn't equipped to provide. And so if you wanna to head to the next slide, um, this suggests to me that we are wielding the wrong tool, right? We're sending an agency that's empowered to remove kids and organized around parental wrongdoing to respond to poverty and other crises. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that kids aren't in difficult situations, right? Just like getting police out of traffic stops doesn't mean that drivers aren't breaking traffic laws that might endanger others. But I think that rather than seeing these as child maltreatment problems, we should think about them instead as poverty and adversity problems and respond accordingly. And so just as we're proposing to take some things out of the realm of police, um, I would envision a, uh, a hotline and response outside of the child welfare infrastructure that we can create or invest in. So mandated reporters, when I talked to them, told me that they called CPS trying to help families. And it's true that CPS often does provide information and make service referrals, but there's no reason that CPS has to be the entity that's doing this, right? So someone else could be coordinating or providing this support. Now I'll acknowledge that sometimes people do call on CPS's threatening capacity. And so we can talk in the discussion if folks are interested about how the CPS hotline might address these calls differently. But I think overall, by taking a step back, we can recognize that most of the families that are currently reported to CPS could be better served outside the agency. Okay, so what could this look like? I'm gonna offer a few kind of criteria or conditions. So first, it's got to be completely distinct from the child welfare agency. So we have to get this out from under the CPS umbrella, right? It can't just be the same thing in different wrapping paper. So for instance, differential response systems were devised to address precisely the issue that I'm talking about. And, you know, we can talk more in the Q&A about why, in my view, uh, differential response is inadequate and in some ways misguided. Second, I think it has to be well-resourced. So no one will turn to something that has nothing to offer. So let's make it at least as resourced as CPS with dedicated staff, not only to take calls, but also to send people out in a timely manner to assist as needed, right? So think about like a fire or an EMS response, right? Something that goes beyond 211 where you call and they say, you know, we don't have any shelter beds today. Sorry, try again tomorrow. And so of course, this means also in tandem making uh, the kind of upstream investments that, that Jerry talked about. So third, this, this has to be truly voluntary. So it has to operate from a different ethos than CPS, right? Again, we're not trying to reinvent the same thing in a different form. And I recognize that this may make child welfare professionals uneasy, right? They have ideas about what they want families to do uh, that will improve conditions for kids. But I think we have to start from the place that parents want to do what's best for their children, right? And once we start there, the task becomes making sure that the supports that are available align with what parents actually want to access. And so finally, I think this can only happen if the effort is, is parent and community led, right? So what I'm envisioning is something that is staffed and directed by people from impacted communities who have the skills to respond to families' needs without involving CPS and are provided with the resources that they need to do so. Thanks. I was on mute. Thank you very much, Kelly, for that. And I definitely think you will we'll get some questions and talk a little bit more about that uh, that sort of concept and framework as we as we go here. So Brian, uh, heading up the the New Mexico child welfare uh, system now, along with other aspects of it, um, and you've had a, a breadth of experiences within the child welfare and, and system and without. So what what do you have for us? What's your what is your actionable idea? Yeah, I appreciate it. And thanks everybody for the opportunity to join. And uh, partially I want to say that like, uh, I think uh, Jerry and Kelly already said it. So actually I don't really need to say, say much, but maybe I'll kind of flesh it out from a public sector perspective. Um, and I think, I mean, we think about transforming systems. One is, another way to say it, I think is we could really just, we're talking about getting rid of silos in a lot of ways. 
Um, but really the question is how you talk about getting rid of silos for 20 years. Uh, and so I, I have three things I want to suggest one around data and data systems, one around funding streams, and then another one around youth voice. And the third one might not be completely intuitive, but just, just give me one second, uh, which I think it'll make sense. Um, so I'm the cabinet secretary in New Mexico, and we talk about getting rid of silos. Um, in New Mexico, it might be a little easier in the sense that uh, we have, we're in a pretty good pers uh, position because in my agency, we have protective services, we have juvenile justice, we ha are the Children's Behavior Health Care Authority for the entire state of New Mexico, and we have an Office of Youth Homelessness. Uh, so when you're talking about silos, we have silos, but uh, we are there. And then also we have, from a position of leadership, it's a little easier uh, because we have a governor, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, uh, who let us all know when, when we came on board that we had to work together or we got fired. Um, and that's kind of a joke. I and mean, then we always say the good part is we love working with each other. And so then you're talking about having the Human Services Agency, for example, which holds Medicaid and mental health services as a uh, as a partner in lockstep with what we're doing, the Department of Health in lockstep with what we are doing, uh, which is vital, I think, in doing some of the changes structurally uh, for our children and families that both Jerry and Kelly were describing and talking about. How do you do it? Uh, but how do you actually do it? Uh, so the first one is data and data systems. Uh, I don't think that you can really get to impacting some of the equity issues uh, that we were talking about uh, and get to a real place of transparency with the public sector um, without having good, strong data systems that make that possible. That includes sharing data. So that's something that you can do on a state and county level, sharing data between departments and making that available. Um, but also something that the federal government uh, can help with, which is creating incentives to build shared data systems. So for example, building uh, MMIS and CWIS shared data systems. So uh, MMIS is the Medicaid Management Information System. CWIS is the Child Welfare Information System. Having those together is huge, but I will say, if you talk to my staff right now, one of the things they will tell you that dominates their time is not being able to spend time with family and children, which they love, it's having to grapple with the data system that they have currently. And so the data system in a lot of ways directs how they work. And so if we get out front and we create trauma responsive therapeutic data systems with appropriate assessment tools built into it that track the things that we really want children and families to use, children and families will be more likely to receive those services across the board in a uniform way that, that we really need and see. Um, the second is funding streams. And so we tend to build systems that act the way they do because of, of money, uh, right? And so um, what do those funding streams look like? I give you concrete examples. So Jerry mentioned that the largest funding stream for child welfare is uh, Title IV-E, or AFDC, FC, foster care benefits, um, from the federal side anyway. Um, but if a, a, a really high-performing child welfare system is doing a good job getting community-based mental health services, um, adverse childhood experience screenings, uh, CAN screenings to really deliver services, one of the highest federal funding streams is going to be Medicaid. But the reason that's not true in a lot of states is because that's difficult to do. Um, because of the silos. And so there can be some work on the federal side, I think, to create some incentives uh, to blend that money. Uh, and then a lot of stuff we can do on the state level, mandating that uh, foster care placements, for example, have access to Medicaid EPSDT contracts for those mental health services, for that wrap. Um, uh, and also allowing, for example, that braided funding to happen in between AFD, CFC, and Medicaid, and like the families first. So not having Medicaid be the payer of first resort, but to be able to build more robust programs by being able to combine those more intentionally through, through direction um, from the federal government. And then also thinking about uh, uh, incentives programs like we see with HUD right now around uh, housing vouchers for older youth. That's fantastic. Exactly the, the direction we want to go in. Uh, and uh, blended programs with legal services corporations. Uh, there's a little, little better that we can do. And yes, I am a recovering legal aid lawyer then give a child a lawyer to be sure these blended systems are working for our families. Uh, and so that from a systems perspective, I wanna know who those kids are who are falling through the cracks so I can help fix it as soon as possible. So those lawyers help me do that. It's a collaboration of sorts. Um, the third component of getting rid of silos um, is really youth voice. And you might be wondering why, because it might not be totally intuitive, but when you ask a child or youth and you really listen to them about what do they need, do you think they, their answer is a silo? Do you think they say what I really need to do is I need to be involved in the juvenile justice system? Or what I really need is I need to be involved in the child welfare system? Uh, no, no, what they talk about is the things they actually need. 
Um, and so when we look at that and we really think about, well, how do we get rid of silos and how do we transform to a trauma responsive system where we're not asking what's wrong with you? We're not asking what's the analysis we need to do to remove a child. Instead, what we're asking is what's happened to you and how can we help? And that's what really talking about getting rid of silos means is so that we're building a response and a system that would be good for kids. And then I think both to Jerry Sally's point too, when we do that, we may find that we have accidentally gotten rid of the child welfare system. Now, I don't mean getting rid of the interventions provided by the child welfare system. I don't mean getting rid of the protections that children need in order to be safe and the, and the support that families need and the funding streams we need to be able to do that. I just mean that once we really look at it this way, we may realize that the child welfare system has outlived its usefulness as a tool, as a front door tool that's predicated on the removal of a child. And instead, we move to that intervention where we say, what has happened? How can we help? And let's utilize everything in the public sector's, um, everything in the public sector's toolbox, all of our funding streams, all of our requirements, all of the things that we can do in order to better support our families and children going forward. I'll mute again. Thank you, Brian. So six though, um, you know, we've talked about the, 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 the front end of child welfare. We've talked about what comes before it. We have talked about Brian's thoughts on, on, you know, to the extent that those services exist and are administered, there should not be this, this silo effect in the back door of how all this stuff is managed. Um, at the, I, I don't want to call it the deep end of the system. There are, there are youth who get older in foster care. There are youth who enter foster care at an older age. Um, we have extended the foster care system in this country over the last decade to include 18 to 21 year olds. And I don't think there's anybody more plugged into what's going on with, with those young people and, and young adults than you are. So what are your, what's your thought um, for just a transformative change that needs to happen to better serve that population. Absolutely. When I think about what could be transformative for this specific population, young people who have entered foster care, what the research tells us is that the average number of placements when a young person ages out is about six. Um, they've been in the system for more than two years, et cetera. And what's become very clear is that we're failing our older young people. When we look at not just the Midwest study, but even some of the recent po um, polls that Foster Club has done, that UPenn has done, that we have done, when you look at the data set, no matter which data set you're looking at, the narrative is the same. Our young people are experiencing high homelessness. They're, unex they're, experiencing, they're not experiencing the connection to work and school and learning in a way that is increasing their income. And that there are a lot of different challenges is that the system just didn't set us up to succeed in. And so when we look at the foundation of why, it's because we're in the wrong system. When I think about what would be catalytic for the healing and the development of young adults and young people is that there would actually be a system where it is aligned with the new neuroscience. We know young people need to be able to take risk. We know young people need connection, right? We know that when we are operating and living within a system that is about mitigating risk, that is about mitigating situations that can cause the state to get in trouble, then it's going to look a lot different than what the actual neuroscience looks like. So when I think about waving a magic wand, I would say, imagine that, you know, there was a different division in child welfare. And in that division, it was looking very, very different where young people were at the center of what's happening to them, where they're making choices, where they have voice and choice. What goes into the data system is literally data that young people might have actually text, text into an application because they said, this is my goal. Um, I, I, I was just on a previous call and I was sharing earlier, just an experience I had two years ago. And that experience was that I walked into a family reunion on my father's side, right? And when I walked in, it was just like, I, I kid you not like the Antoine Fisher movie when you first like the opening scene, right? Like it's what I feel like a lot of foster you dream of um, when they think about reconnecting to family and everybody was so welcoming. And yet I was deeply disturbed that day. And what I was deeply disturbed at was the fact that there was um, young children running around 
who like didn't look like me. Now, let me tell you something about Puerto Ricans. We come in all shapes and sizes and we are very dark, we're very light and that's what a family would look like. But it was unexplainable to me, kind of like the Mexican sibling set that was running around, right? And so when I would ask questions like, who, who are they? They're like, oh, those are cousins. And it finally came out that five of my uncles and aunts there were foster adoptive uh, parents and that they have been fostering and adopting sibling sets as a, as a tradition on my father's side for more than 35 years, which is older than I am. And so when I think back to, wait, how did we miss that? It was because of the way that the system was structured in engaging with the 15 year old me. When I did get back into contact with the system, it was, cl it, it was clear that hmm, you probably shouldn't share the adults in your life with the system because Lord knows what type of can of worms you're gonna open up, X, Y, Z. So we are missing out on family, on opportunity, on building a foundation where it's centered in, in, in healing and centered in really developing our abilities because of the current design of the system that we all inherited. And we inherited the system. So now the question becomes, what does a system that, um, that enables young people to heal, develop, and thrive actually look like. And we're in the beginnings of that journey with the state of Washington, where we're looking at, um, we're in the middle of a, a discovery sprint of, of designing, what does it look like to have a division that's not focused on your foster care label, but focus on how is it that you heal? How is it that you develop? How is it that you actually orchestrate, the system orchestrates an environment where foster youth, youth with um, in juvenile rehab and so forth could actually be saying, hmm, how do I strengthen my family network? How do I get involved in those experiences that build the foundation for who I am about to become, right? And so those are the things that I think, I, I honestly think it is a doable, it is achievable thing to start thinking about what does a new older youth system look like between the finance um, uh, the initiatives that are going on, between what the Biden-Harris administration has proposed forward, um, you know, what President Biden talked about last night in terms of, of having, you know, two years of community college available, about care um, being available. I think if these things come to pass, we're in a we're at a moment where we could truly be leveraging the the inertia that's happening and saying, how do we make sure that foster care young people don't experience second or third or fourth wave? But how are we at the forefront? And how do we make sure that we're leveraging each and one of those advantages to structure it a bit a bit different so that we can move forward? And it could look like something crazy as imagine that we actually have young people not only having voice and choice over their own lives, but like imagine if we pay, like young people pick someone to pay to be their independent living coach, right? The same way that people that people right now are family members who have, who are taking care of their elderly loved ones get to get to pick who actually gets paid to take care of their, their elderly loved one, right? So we're seeing innovation in other spaces and I feel like we're just at such a time where we can leverage that. Amazing, man. Thank you for, for sharing all that, both personally about your family and about your ideas. Just to be clear for attendees, you know, if I hear you right, you're, you're saying that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about like what, what is appropriately considered to be child welfare and, and not on the front end. But you're, you, it sounds like you, what you're proposing is we actually may need to, you know, when, when fostering connections pass and even before that, you know, all that kind of just added on older youth services to the existing system. Are you, and you're saying like, let's, 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 just, let's create a, a disconnection there um, because, you know, some, some of those young people might not want to stay in foster care for very good reasons and associate foster care with not a great time in their life. The reality is, is that unlike other countries, we don't have an agenda for our older youth and our young adults. We don't have a family agenda as a country. It's, it's like a weird idea for me to even say this out loud to people, right? And what I see as essential is that our constitution said, like, we have the right to liberty, um, happiness, you know, freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And my, and what I believe is that when you've had significant adverse childhood experiences, right? When you had significant experiences that have um, affected your pathway and opportunity to be able to reach that goal, right? Then is there space for an agency, 
right? A new, a new entity that is responsible for thinking 24 seven. How do I leverage the neuroscience that we know about rewiring the brain where we can give certain experiences, right? That a young person can heal from what they've been through. So what is that gonna mean? For me, it means something like yes, talk therapy, yes, medications when needed and appropriate, but also there are a lot of different initiatives. There are a lot of other different mediums that we're learning around dealing with trauma, healing from trauma. How do we have folks thinking about social capital? <laughs> your loved ones, the people you're connected to, the community that you're connected to, hyper-focusing on how are we facilitating and bringing those connections in. These are functions as we start to get deeper, sound like child welfare, but the more that we get deeper into it and what's required to build them, it might be a division, a new division, it might be a whole new system. And so open to the how, but what I truly believe is that the design of what we've inherited from this system will not be positioned to actually help um, young adults heal, develop, and thrive. And that now that we know this goes way beyond 18, down to the late 26, right, that there is space for um, imagining that this generation should have an agency that is thinking thoroughly about the developmental opportunities that they have to heal and develop. Awesome. Barrett, you have, uh, you have heard some compelling ideas here. Um, requirements for parity, a voluntary front-end reporting system that, that is community-based and inspired. Uh, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you love to hear data integration. That's, that's something you guys have some expertise in. And Sixto proposing that we rethink the idea that we lumped in older, <laughs> older youth and young adults into a system that was geared towards younger people. Um, and it may not have the, that may not match up. So um, you've got a background in, in technology here. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, with that hat on, like what you think of everything you just heard. Yeah, well, I, um, I really think um, that it, the key is what, as everyone's talked about, really focusing clearly on the youth and the families and their needs and not on our system and our compliance. And we have technology that can allow us to do that, link together the different systems. I, I've seen in the chat people's concerns about the linking of the data and we have to be very careful about that and do that very thoughtfully. But I think we really need to start from te in technology, not from how to foster tech, um, compliance with the system or serve our system, but how we're really gonna serve um, the youth and families and link them to the community. I think that's, that's the one big, um, big shift that we need to make. Um, and our, you know, we've built systems for, you know, we've built systems for years and years and years um, that help um, manage with compliance and don't help, and don't do that empowerment and focus centered on the family. So that's, that's really, um, you know, that's my sort of big takeaway for this is, um, you know, the way we're doing it at Binti, we're, we're really excited to build um, portals. Um, we have a foster parent portal so that foster parents can do all their work and get all the information they need online um, and, and get, things, get things done that way. But we're really excited about expanding that to have a youth portal um, so that um, youth can participate meaningfully um, in, their, in their care plan. Um, to have a, a, a portal for the family of origin so that they can participate really meaningfully in the services, identify people um, that, can, that can help and have um, portals for other, other actors in the system to, um, to really meaningly, meaningfully um, uh, collaborate together. So I, I just, that's my big takeaway from what people are saying is I think technology can help break down those silos and help focus on youth we do it with technology every day in our everyday life. Um, and we just need to fundamentally shift our, our focus that way. So, um, so we have uh, some great questions coming in on the chat. Keep them coming. We get to them pretty quickly. I just have a few roundtable things I wanted to kind of put in front of these guys um, because we're talking about things that ultimately here um, would be it implemented either on a state or a county level. It would be a local, it would be a local effort. But we know that, you know, compared to say juvenile justice, the influence of the federal government when it when it comes to child welfare is is, is significant because there's a significant amount of money going out the door. Um, you know, just like every year, but just by a quick example, you know, just um, 
as an addition, a supplemental, you know, the, the federal government sent $500 million to just 15 states to help them with easing uh, into, you know, family first laws and all that stuff um, pretty recently. So my question is this, though, what federal laws and policies do you think most need to change or simply go away in terms of achieving the kinds of uh, ideas that you guys have presented here today? And I, I'll, I'll leave that up to anybody. Is it, does anybody see, you know, an existing law or policy as actually a barrier to, to transformation right now? I'd love to jump in on that real, real quickly uh, here, John. Um, yeah, uh, ASFA. Uh, I, I, uh, unabashed. So for, for, for some people that might not oh, yeah. know, it's the Adoption and Safe Families Act, uh, which I, I believe was passed in 1998. So yeah. sorry, keep going. 97, sorry. 98. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, we need to repeal it, uh, pure, pure and simply. Uh, it, um, the TPR requirements uh, there are arbitrary, even though there are people who say, yeah, we studied the data and uh, it was based on that. You don't come up with 15 out of 22 months uh, unless it's just uh, a result of discussion, compromise, and um, uh, probably a few other things. But um, it, it violates everything we know uh, about uh, recovery time for families uh, in substance uh, misuse treatment uh, programs, the, the, the relapse. It, it, penalizes unduly incarcerated uh, parents uh, out there and the aggravated circumstances provisions uh, make it even easier to forego making uh, reasonable uh, efforts out there to keep, uh, keep, keep families together. And this inordinately affects uh, black and indigenous families because they're so already overrepresented uh, in, in, in child welfare in our prison system and in other social institutions that, uh, that get affected uh, by this law. Uh, it overwhelmingly favors adoption uh, which means the breakup of, of a family uh, out there over reunification. We incentivize states uh, to place more and more kids for adoption, yet we don't incentivize them to keep families together and to reunify children who come into the to the foster care system. Um, and, and I'll just add one last thing to it is that the reasonable efforts requirements to reunify and, and uh, to finalize permanency plans that are a part of the law, I think are well intended, uh, but it, they're laughable uh, in uh, implementation. They become a checklist out there and, and a means of, of claiming 4E dollars. So I, I don't see any real good coming of that, uh, of the whole Adoption and Safe Families Act. You know, one of the things that I would, I would, I would go on there is that there are some provisions, like I think we need to get rid of the racist stuff, the structural racist stuff. And one of them being that right now, it, in order to claim $40, you have to do some eligibility on that young person. So if you're poor enough, then the federal government will give the state money because your family was poor enough on that sense. Now, the implication of that is what? I think we see it. Do you see uh, a child welfare agency satellite office and, you know, in the nice, uh, in, in the areas that more pe people with a higher income live in? And the answer is no. And that is an actual pattern that we see in, all over the country. When we see who's in our systems, we see a certain demographic of folks in the system. So I think there's one thing there. But what I also wanted to mention right now um, is like there is there is legislation that needs to be repealed. Yes. And there's also just bureaucratic steps. So when I think about this Chafee, um, and, uh, the, uh, the, the Chafee extra stimulus dollars, right? An extra additional $400 million that have gone to states, right? And we have been in contact with over 30 states who we are understanding what some of these barriers are. A lot of people are upset because they're like, hey, um, we're not, people are not moving, people are not doing stuff. And that actually is not true. People are moving, but there are 5,000 steps to cut a check to a young person in the middle of a pandemic. And if we can't figure it out then, then when do we get to figure that piece out, right? So what we're seeing is that the fact that, you know, money has to move from the feds to the state, but then the state has to have a plan. A whole bunch of people have to sign off. Then there, if you're in a county-based system, then on top of that, your counties have to now get a guidance from the state on how to spend the money. And all of these additional steps have created a condition that it takes forever to get something out. This happened, this money was approved by Congress in December. 
it is May and we still don't have millions and millions of dollars out the door to young people. And that's because I think we have to start looking and studying what are these bureaucratic steps that are in place? How do we streamline some of that so that people can do things? But most importantly, there is a culture of compliance, which then in, 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 in penalizing people, which then creates the condition of inaction. And so when you are that state person, if you do spend the money wrongly, the one, the money can go out the door and you can spend it wrongly, which is already an issue. Secondly, you didn't get fired. And so a lot of people at a lot of different places are very scared of having to lose their jobs and prefer to wait for that compliance and they're not incentivized to be bold. And so I think so much of our issues here have to do not just with the legislation, but with the culture of compliance that is reinforced by you losing your job if you're not doing these extra steps. Um, it is not a, child welfare is not a place where you are incentivized to say, let me take some bold action. Brian, I, um, I, and then Kelly, I'll get to you right after that. Brian, um, I, I don't wanna put you on the spot with this as like specifically speaking for New Mexico, but I do wanna ask you about what Sixto said just now, because he's describing something that came out of the federal government with very little bureaucracy, you know? Like it, it went out the door flexibly. And it seems, you know, Sixto was, was nice enough to join me on, on our uh, podcast, the Imperial Weekly Podcast, Quick Shill. Um, to to talk about what what they're seeing in the states um but like what is what are the things that happen when money lands flexibly in a state that goes wrong because i think that would help to kind of figure out like okay next time something like this happens god forbid you know we're better equipped to get right through it so what what is it what what, what happens there you know i mean that's, <laughs> that's a really broad question um I, you know i think i think part of it is that uh you know, states generally would benefit from a quite a bit higher technical assistance in how to get money out of them people's hands. And I, and I don't say that lightly. Uh, you know, a lot of the technical assistance is given to states is about how to avoid audit findings. And so in other words, you're saying uh, add additional processes, err on the side of not giving money uh, to be sure that you don't have audit findings. And instead, what would really benefit is give us uh, technical assistance and coaching around how do we get this out quickly. Um, and sometimes that really works. So, for example, the, um, the additional uh, FMAP around the pandemic funding that came in uh, during the pandemic was great. Uh, in the state of New Mexico, we got that money out to families right away. So you talk about stimulus checks, but then you talk about we had stimulus checks for our older youth specifically uh, to be sure they were able to stay in housing. And we just got that money right into their pocket and uh, no additional went direct, directly to their bank or directly into their hands uh, in order to be able to do that. So some of that stuff is possible. Um, but also I, your original question was like, what's, what's on the federal level that we need to change? And I mean, part of it is some of those arcane rules that make it difficult to jump through hoops to figure out eligibility that make states operate in a culture of fear because they're really worried about the audit in the first place. And the more that it doesn't mean we should have irresponsible, uh, you know, carte blanche in giving funding. But I think we all agree that we could go back and look at the financing systems uh, for this and clean it up and make it simpler. And then, and this is something that Jerry has been saying for years, is also look at where the funding goes and incentivize the things we want to incentivize. And a major way to do that would be opening up 4E, look at the uh, 1996 look back rules, uh, which is essentially kind of strangling the system, which is okay if there's other money going in for pieces of the system that we want and opening it up so that there's, uh, these families have access to it and states have access to do real prevention work upstream. Families First was an important half step in that direction, but we could do so much more uh, opening up those federal funding streams for prevention and not requiring court intervention and removal to get access to that money across the board. I see. Kelly, I'm sorry I cut you off before. What? No, uh, and actually, Brian, that was exactly what I wanted to hit on around Families First. I think um, it's certainly a, a, a step forward to be, you know, uh, investing fewer resources in and out of home care, but I also worry about the um, the focus on these kinds of uh, therapeutic services as opposed to concrete supports that we know that families need and the way that the services are still provided under this, again, this child welfare umbrella, right? So um, we are telling families, you know, if uh, we're almost setting them up for failure, right? And we're going to put all of these conditions on you. If you don't comply with these various therapeutic services, we've said that your child is at risk of entering foster care. And so now our hands are tied and that's what we have to do. 
Um, and just, you know, speaking kind of anecdotally from conversations I, I've had in New York City, where, where we sort of are already seeing this uh, kind of preventive services infrastructure, right? A lot of the conversation among service providers is like, hey, let's call ACS because, you know, I don't think this child needs to be removed, but let's just get them into preventive services. And so when child welfare becomes the route to these types of therapeutic services, what we see is families being, being shuttled to the child welfare agency when people don't necessarily have concerns about abuse or neglect. And so that's something that I think uh, we need to, we really need to rethink. I just want to note, we've come to the point where we think so badly about child welfare that everyone has this inertia around like, let's not even try to bring people to child welfare. But I kind of think to myself, I imagine, and I'm not advocating for this, but I imagine what would a world look like where an engagement with the child welfare system wasn't a negative experience. And it was just like, I came to the child welfare system because I didn't have enough money, right? And then all of a sudden, some of that jobs money that's being pushed around got leveraged to help me do a reskilling and now I can provide for me and my family much more right I got the support I needed with my with my child who was exhibiting these behaviors and it was from a place of respect and cultural competence you know the vision that I have you know, one day is that we we do have an agency that looks completely different and that it's not about separating families but that when there is engagement, there is this like, holy crap, it was catalytic for the outcome. Kelly, yeah, what's and if, I, if you oh, don't, ahead, please. I'm sorry, John, I was gonna add to that. It's such a great point. And it's so, it's kind of a courageous point to make um, about the child welfare system. I have a, a very dear, dear friend who runs a healthcare system. And he says that the, the most brilliant thing that child welfare directors have done is to convince everybody that the key to their success is to be sure they serve no one, right? The lower the caseloads and the less people they serve, the more success. If you can't get away with that if you're a healthcare services director. Like the point is to serve everyone who's sick. The point of the child welfare system should be to provide appropriate services for everyone who's experienced trauma. And why do we allow child welfare to get away with it? I say that as someone who runs the child welfare system, we should not allow that to happen. If we need and want the child welfare system to be profoundly different, we should make that happen. So I wanted, um, yep, go ahead. So absolutely, I think there are ways that we can think about how to make the child welfare system, as you say, kind of um, more service oriented. I, I just, I the, the thing that I think about a lot is, um, you know, the, at its core, right, no matter how um, compassionate and respectful case, case workers are, and I, I got to shadow very professional, very respectful case workers, um, you know, as many service referrals as they're able to offer, I think nothing changes the fundamental fact that they come in with the power to remove, to remove your child, to separate your family. And um, that is sort of the threat that looms over the entire interaction. And I don't think that it's often, I don't think that it's necessarily because um, folks who are working for the system are eager to tear these families apart, right? But there's nothing that they can do to change the role that they have and the power that they have. And so I guess the question I would ask is, you know, all of those functions around sort of providing job assistance, providing uh, kind of housing assistance, um, does that need to be connected to an agency that uh, has the power to separate families? Um, I want to get to some of the great attendee questions that we've gotten here. And uh, I mean, we got five minutes till three o'clock on the East Coast, but, um, you know, if you guys are down to stick around, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going past that. I think we have it booked past that. But um, so Kelly, uh, a philosophical question on your idea here. Um, would the funding for community-based organizations come from the government? And if so, do you think that would compromise their capacity to function as an alternative to government-run child welfare agencies? I think that kind of gets to the debate we're having here a little bit too, you know, is um, yeah. I, I guess they're, what they're really trying to ask is like, how do you, how do you give um, what you're proposing kind of the, the necessary imprimatur of a voluntary community and not um, a place that might go and report you, I guess. Sure, yeah, yeah. and I, I will, would certainly defer to others on the panel as well who might be, uh, you know, have more expertise in the, the actual nuts and bolts policy aspect of it. I, I absolutely think that it's something that needs public investment. Otherwise it sort of uh, becomes privy to the whims of, you know, foundation funding and other things. So um, I do, and, I think that we can almost think about it as like a, a fire or like an EMS service, right? So I remember interviewing one uh, fire chief who, or a uh, firefighter EMS uh, responder 
who said that the reason that he called CPS was because he said, you know, our job is to be there for the person who called us, right? That's all we're doing. We're not going to tell them how to parent or we're not going to tell them how to clean up their house. You know, our job is you called us for this reason. Now let us come and assist you with what it is that you need. Um, and so I think that's the kind of model that I'm envisioning for the front end. I think one of the most important things to be mindful as we think about this front end though, is who are we empowering to actually have access? How tough are we making it? Because the reality is, is that less than 10% of all funding, like philanthropic funding goes to leaders of color. So when we talk about who's serving our communities, when we think about that on the federal funding, public funding side or philanthropic side, it's just like, who's actually going to be able to get the contract to do the work? That's one. Secondly, where do we have space for uh, like these uh, interventions that haven't been created to date? Because the reality is, is that I think that we have a core group of interventions. I don't think we've actually experienced or, or, or experimented enough to actually build evidence about around other programs, because there's even a privilege and a luxury to even have your program evaluated, right? And so I think that there is something significantly broken in the system right now about who gets to serve who. And that also causes its own dynamic when people are being served by people who like when the whole infrastructure doesn't look like them. Not that, you know, I'm very happy for whoever showed up at the door when I was going through my stuff. Um, and there were things that worked about it and didn't. Yeah, and I think just very quickly, exactly to Six's point, I think uh, the way that we sort of separate these things, uh, you know, is, is to uh, have them be staffed and led by people from the community, right? Not outsiders coming in to say, you know, here's what we think you should do. And we're gonna, you know, call the authorities on you if you don't. And I, I would add, like moving that into the into the community, the child welfare system has to be a partner with all those community-based agencies. You know, state-run child welfare systems are not tied to their communities. County-administered ones are not as tied into their communities. You know, speaking to what Brian was talking about about silos, we really need to 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 partner not only within our agencies and the health agencies, but in the community and foster foster the kind of community development that allows communities to, um, to build the services that they need um, and, and be able to have the child welfare system be supportive of that. Well, and I would also say, again, this, I, say, I feel like this goes back to compliance because why is there silos? Because the moment I form a relationship with the wrong small nonprofit who tried something different and then bam, it didn't go according to plan, someone's in trouble, right? We haven't rewarded that activity. And, there's, and, and, and also we don't capture those good points. So there's nowhere in your audit, right? When they're doing a CFRs review, uh, where in the audit does it say, what innovative thing have you done that is that we should be rewarding you even more as a state? Like, let me check that box off. <laughs> Brian, we have, not, uh, we have not talked a lot about legal counsel uh, but on, the, on this yet, but we, uh, maybe we'll do another, a whole other one. Maybe we'll do a whole other, not webinar, because I just refuse to call them that anymore. But can you, this is a question from an attendee, can you expand on what you mentioned about attorneys being a bridge to reducing silos in the system? How do, how do they do that? How would they do that? Yeah, sure. I think from a public sector's perspective, it's a mistake to think of uh, attorneys as uh, bad guys. Uh, instead, I think uh, attorneys who represent our children, so specifically this kind of attorney, I won't speak about any others, uh, but attorneys who represent children and families, um, you know, they perform a really powerful role because if you think about it, their job is to go out and find children and families that are slipping through the cracks. Well, from a public sector perspective, I couldn't pay enough for that service because that's children and families that for whatever reason, our policies, our structure, we fail to serve. And so we need and want to find them. And, and we want, we need and want them to raise the visibility of the struggles they're going through so that we can assist and help them. Um, and lawyers who represent children and families can perform that function. And there's a couple of places where there's been really innovative funded collaborations where the public sector actually funds those lawyers to read, to work with those kids and work in a collateral way. You were, you were talking about like, you know, things that we could clean up on the federal side that would help. One of them is it's been awesome to open up 4E for legal representation for kids in uh, foster care cases. That's awesome. What would be even more awesome is making it super clear that they're able to use that funding in order to fund what we call collateral legal issues. Because if you really think about what we're doing as a child welfare system, 
Uh, sometimes it's poverty issues, housing issues, helping access benefits, helping access health insurance. So that should be funded by that $40 because it would help us, the public sector and the child welfare system so much if we were able to attach attorneys to those children in order to help them get those services and be that bridge, um, because that's something that we're not very good at, uh, is to be able to advocate outside of our own system to help get those services for kids, but lawyers are excellent at it. Yeah, you're can not just, Yeah, yeah, I just, I can't let that one go by um, without affirming everything that um, that Brian has, has just said. We were able uh, to open up 4E for um, a, a limited use of, of 4 funds uh, for attorneys for both children and their parents. And I, I wanna make sure that we don't lose sight of the need for parents uh, to have high quality legal representation out there. Uh, as Brian has noted, the missing uh, gap right there, uh, right now is uh, funding for uh, civil legal rep representation for the things that he's just mentioned, those concrete things that lead families uh, to the absence of which leads families to the door of a child welfare agency or leads the child welfare agency to their door. Uh, and uh, we need to open that up. Uh, that is a little bit more complicated um, in, a, um, in a policy uh, framework uh, for, to, to accomplish, but it is not anywhere near impossible. We, we took the first initial steps on that uh, a, a few months ago, and uh, I can only hope that uh, uh, that is something that's in our future because high quality legal representation is prevention. It gives voice uh, to people who uh, very often have no voice uh, of, of their own. And without it, uh, our families are incredibly disadvantaged in, in a system as complex as child welfare. Jerry, I have a, a question from an attendee for you here, um, saying that, you, you know, I know Jerry's worked closely with elders and leaders from the indigenous communities throughout the country, and wondering if you could speak to sort of the wisdom of, of purpose and intent within tribal child welfare systems with adequate funding. How can, how can that be replicated in all child welfare systems? Well, I think we can understand what's working in so many of the uh, of the tribal communities out there. The models uh, that come to my mind for how communities come together around the needs uh, of, of their families, their children, their young people, how the whole issue of culture is applied. Uh, <clears throat> they are often at odds with, with, with federal laws. It, it's those models uh, that, that inspire me uh, to think about how can we replicate those kind of community-based uh, know our population, serve our population um, kinds of uh, situations that occur in, in the tribal uh, communities uh, out there. We've tried our best to, to learn uh, from them. One of the, uh, when I mentioned repeal of ASPA, ASPA has a particularly deleterious effect uh, on tribal communities because of the cultural issues around, uh, around uh, termination uh, of, of parental rights. Uh, and uh, we do not fund uh, those programs uh, that, that are serving our indigenous population out there anywhere near uh, the extent to which we should. Jerry, um, since you were the one that, that brought up repeal of ASWA, I'm curious in your mind, um, if, if that is essentially a rejection of the concept of the timeline in that law, do you think that do you think it needs to be replaced with a new way of thinking about timeline supremacy? Do you think the federal government should just be out of that business entirely and let states decide about that? Or do you think there's already an existing piece of federal policy or law that does okay on doing it? I mean, I guess my point is like the, the reason ASFA passed in part was because of that concern about kids staying in care for a long time. Do, do you think that, I guess that you know, I'm asking, like, do you think we already, we have what we need in place to assure that without ask for, or would it need to be replaced with some kind of different way of thinking about timelines? Well, I think, I think that there are a lot of different ways to, to take that. And no, nobody wants uh, children to spend 18 years in a foster care system when it is actually impossible uh, for them to, uh, to go back uh, to, to their families. But I think when we think about that and, and, and the whole thing, it, it, it's what I've thought about throughout this panel discussion here. It's not just my idea or what, what Brian has said or what Kelly or Barrett or Sixto said. It's if you take these concepts 
uh, <clears throat> collectively. Uh, that's where I think we have real power to transform uh, what we call a child welfare system out there. Yeah, we need flexibility in our funding. Yes, we need less compliance. We need uh, the ability to work across uh, hard and fast lines <clears throat> of other child and family service uh, systems out there. Any one of those things can make a big impact, but it's the collective uh, <clears throat> um, the collective application of, of those ideas, I think, that will truly be uh, transformative so that if we become uh, a system that's more about uh, child and family well-being, that's more about preserving and strengthening families, then I think we obviously are going to have less need to worry about when do we terminate uh, a, a parent's rights or when do we place uh, a child uh, for adoption? It has to be part uh, of, of the broader package out there. But the 15 of 22 months, uh, <clears throat> I, I cannot reconcile that uh, in, in my way of thinking uh, is anything but uh, arbitrary and punitive uh, to families. Kelly, one for you. Um, I've lost it in my little uh, aggregation thing, so I'm going to paraphrase it. But this is the, I think, the, the sense of the question is this. Do you think that in the concept of kind of a community-driven voluntary reporting system, which one makes more sense? Uh, some, somebody that is um, independent of child welfare that is meant to discern the nature of a report and kick it one way or the other, or actually training people and educating people on like which one of these hotlines you'd have to call. Does that make sense? Like which? Yeah, I, I think what I'm envisioning is the latter, right? So okay. um, creating and investing and developing something that people can call when they are concerned about kids, when they want someone to right. check in and, and make sure that families have what they need rather than a kind of pre-CPS, right? Like a triage for CPS. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I gotcha. I'm not sure if that quite answers it. Yeah. Yeah, and if, I mean, if I could chime in there, I mean, it, that, that approach seems to work really well. Uh, so we, we created something like that in New Mexico, just because like I mentioned, we're a bunch of different departments. And so we set up our centralized intake lines, just call us. Uh, and so we can help. We might be connecting to community-based mental health services. It might be connecting to food programs, especially during pandemic. Uh, figuring out how to help kids get back into school who are disconnected from school, like all of those things. The key, though, is that culture shift so that it's a safe conversation. It feels safe for the family to reach out and have that conversation. And so I know uh, Barrett uh, up in the chat earlier talking about kind of data and sharing that and how important that is. It's got to come with an accompanying culture shift is what, what the point he made in the chat. And I think that's so true. Um, there is a culture shift so that you're asking those right questions and creating uh, creating that safe space so that it really is an intervention that looks at how just how the system can help uh, across the board. And I, I would add, I think there's a lot of promising models of having mobile response that provides really concrete help to, to all families in a community. I know New Jersey's done a lot of work in that area. Um, and that can be one of the sort of network of partners um, that um, that the child welfare that becomes the child welfare system. So it's a, a child well-being system, not a child protection system. Mm -hmm. um, and and the the front door can be centralized or decentralized, but th the network has to be able to to um, talk to each other. And that's a role that technology can play is um, help having it talk to each other and yet and protecting um, the data um, so that so that folks aren't ensnared in the system. We could go on for a very long time here. You guys have uh, stuck with me well past um, well past the hour mark, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end it here. And I just want to thank all of our attendees for being super engaged. This is amazing just to try and watch and get all of these comments and listen to you guys at the same time. So I, I really appreciate it. Sixto had to bounce early, so I'll I'll personally thank him a little later. But thank you guys all for joining us uh, for this session. We'll probably do something like this again sometime. If you have any feedback for us directly. Uh, you can hit up uh, tips at imprintnews.org, um, and we'll also be sending out the, um, the recording of this to everybody who uh, registered, whether they're here or not. So thank you, everybody, and have a, uh, a lovely Thursday.